Welcome to Wholesale Change, the podcast and webcast from Distribution Strategy Group, where we provide thought leadership for wholesale change agents. And if you're on this call, you probably are a wholesale change agent. I'm Ian Heller. I'll be one of your hosts today. I'd also like to welcome my business partner, the Tower of Analytical Power, Jonathan Bine, and our resident inside sales expert, Debbie Paul. How are you doing today, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen? Lady and gentlemen. Great. Thanks, Ian. <laughs> I'm feeling kind of plural at the moment. Yeah. Can you see my screen okay, though? Yes. Okay, good. Good. All right. So this is an interesting topic. I've written about this in the past. We've talked about it a lot. Um, so of all the distributors that you know, what percent would you say claim that they have a role called inside sales? Jonathan? I think north of 75% would, would, would call, have a role called inside sales. Right. I'm asking a follow-up question, so you probably know where I'm going. Debbie, what about you? I would say it's probably closer to 85 to 90. Okay. And of the, of the people who say they have an inside sales role, what percentage would you say actually differentiate between customer service and inside sales? 85. Well, oh, that differentiate, I would yeah. say... Five percent. Wow, pretty low, Jonathan. Percent. I would say it's in that realm as well. Okay, that's my experience too. So let's jump into some definitions here, um, and uh, talk about the differences between customer service and inside sales, and what these roles really can do or should do for most distributors. Uh, Debbie, you want to start? Sounds good. Do you want to bring the slides up, Ian? You know, I show that I have slides showing. So let me just go over here real quick. And uh, let's see here. I think I forgot to share. I'm sorry. There you go. <laughs> sorry. Um, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, I need another cup of coffee it's this morning. morning. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, okay, good. So customer service, inside sales, outbound telemarketing, proactive inside sales. Walk us through what these are, Debbie. Sure. So I think when, when most distributors talk about inside sales, they're really referring to customer service people. And customer service groups are typically going to be reactive. So they're reacting to you know, issues with, you know, with, with product, or they might be even explaining product or finding product for someone. But, but customer service is typically, as at least the way I define it, is typically more of a reactive service function. Inside sales is also typically reactive. Um, and I think some distributors like to say that, well, there's a little bit of, of sales activity on the inbound call going on with inside sales. But, but to me, inside sales is, is much more typically reactive, more along the customer service lines. Yeah, you know, in my experience, Debbie, distributors use these terms uh, synonymously. Absolutely. So. You know, yep. they, they call it inside sales because people are writing orders and they may mm -hmm. occasionally push promotions, but they're not managing accounts. And I mean, talk a little bit about the psychological makeup of a person like this. Right. So this type of an individual is really someone who's going to be more service oriented. So they're going to want to problem solve. They, they want to make a customer happy um, versus a sales type of a personality is really someone who's more curious, who wants to find out and get information, find opportunity, um, kind of more that hunter versus farmer type of mentality. Right. So the um, outbound telemarketer is more like an outside sales rep. Well, a little bit, but to me, outbound telemarketing is kind of more focused around kind of more campaigns. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes distributors will have campaigns with suppliers, you know, a supplier will come in and say, yeah, we've got, you know, these, these two products are going to be on special this week. Can we do a product campaign to your customers around these particular products? And so I kind of like to call that more outbound telemarketing. Got it. So you're distinguishing actually between outbound telemarketing and proactive inside sales. Exactly. Okay. So, and so, so let's go through the fourth role then. What is proactive inside sales? So, so you've got customer service, which is really order taking. And, and, and by the way, I don't mean to demean the role. Someone's got to do that function, oh, yeah, provide customer support. And customers often have very close relationships with these people. Mm -hmm. And then inside sales, that's pretty similar. I mean, usually it's just a, a different title, but maybe those people are a little bit more aggressive in terms of writing orders, but they're mostly this mission of service orientation mm -hmm. in either case, right? 
Correct. And then outbound telemarketing, you see this as not really managing accounts as much as dialing for dollars. So mm -hmm. almost the boiler room, you know, Correct. hey, we got a power tool promotion. Let's call everybody and see if we can talk them into some power tools. And then right. proactive insight sales as the fourth category. Why don't you go into what that is about? Yeah. So that, that really is more of, you know, managing an account base, looking for opportunities. Because we like to say this role is really a field sales rep without a car. So they're doing the same types of activities that a field sales rep would do. They're just not doing it on the road. They're doing it from their desk. Got it. And what's the, uh, I don't know, the psychographics of this last role? Well, again, I think, you know, you need someone who's, who has more of a, what I call a sales mentality or a sales skill set. You know, they're, they want to find those opportunities. They're, they're actively, you know, probing to understand what are, what are needs, what are opportunities? You know, how can I, how can I help this customer be more efficient, more effective? How can I help them save money? Um, so they're really much more engaged in the, in the customer's business. Um, from a bigger picture perspective than any of the other roles would be. And what about uh, ability? So, so how about tolerance for rejection? Mm -hmm. Well, I think tolerance for rejection, again, most of these roles are targeted at customers. Mm -hmm. The outbound telemarketing role and even the proactive inside sales role um, oftentimes are involved in doing prospecting as well. Mm -hmm. So they are going to have to be a little bit more tolerant when it comes to, you know, someone, you know, maybe not having time to talk to them today. Um, so yeah, so there's definitely going to be more in the outbound telemarketing role and certainly the sales role because of the prospecting piece. Yeah. So, I mean, what I've seen with customer service people is they really, really don't like rejection. I mean, they don't want to be <laughs> rejected. And mm -hmm. so one of the ways that they ensure they aren't rejected is they give away discounts so that price mm -hmm. doesn't become an objection. And I remember... You know, a while ago, I was sitting in a call center for a company that is a metal services center. And I was sitting next to this customer service person listening in on the call because I really like to do that when I work with a distributor and try to understand the business. And this purchasing agent called in. And this purchasing agent was, you could tell, just reading off lines off of a PO. You know, I need 100 linear feet of this and I need, you know, 200 feet of this and I need 300 pounds, whatever it was. And he named off five or six items. And he was like reading off an order and the customer services service person's reaction was, uh, Oh, okay, great. That item is normally uh, $45 and 23 cents per hundred pounds, but I'll give it to you for 37. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you could actually hear the purchasing agent having to stop and correct the pricing on the PO. It was almost an inconvenience. I mean, this person was giving away margin and a lot of margin to a person who wasn't asking for it. And I think one of the mistakes that I see customer service people make, and this is a training issue, it's not their fault, mm -hmm. is that they see price as another thing that they give away to be nice to the customer rather than the way they get paid back for all the good things they do for customers. Mm -hmm. Do you see that? Absolutely. And I think it's, it is a lack of training. It's a lack of understanding, you know, the business and understanding margins and how that works. But they really are truly just, they think that they're really being helpful, that they're going to, you know, make this customer happier by giving them a discount voluntarily. Um, so yeah, absolutely. And you can yeah. sometimes see that, you know, even, even with inside sales where people are, might be a little bit more sales savvy, they're still doing very much the same thing. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's. Definitely. So Debbie, we had a question about uh, compensation for proactive inside sales. So maybe how that would differ from, let's say, customer service on the one hand versus field sales on the other hand. Right. So I believe in in incenting people for what they do. And oftentimes when I create a program, I will create something that's around, um, you know, what are you trying to do with the program? Well, you're trying to grow sales and you're trying to typically grow margin you might be trying to retain customers as well. Um, so grow wallet share, retention. So one of the, the things that I like to do is incent based on percent of growth year over year. So you're paying for incremental growth versus just paying a flat amount of incentive on all that person's sales or gross margin dollars. So I always try to look at what is the incremental difference that I'm trying to make here and then you would incent around that. And the incentive programs could be, you know, probably a part of that would be base. 
a part of that would be variable pay. And it really depends on the company and it depends on, you know, how much you're trying, what you're really trying to do, what your goals are for the program. But it could be typically 70% base, 30% variable pay or 60, 40 or 80, 20, you know, depending on what um, kind of what fits in with that company's culture and what the goals of the program are. Yeah, this gets to one of my uh, management pet peeves, which is, you know, they, you reward one thing and expect another. And there was a book a long time ago called The Greatest Management Principle in the World, which is you get what you reward. Mm-hmm. And I've seen this over and over again, not just in distributors, but frequently in distributors where, you know, you're asking for, you know, A outcome and you're getting B outcome. But if you look at the reward system, you're rewarding B. And look, you know, most of us at heart, we're capitalists and you're, we're going to do what you pay us to do. Mm-hmm. And so you really can't, you know, you, you got to, if you want growth, you better reward growth. And I've heard a lot of people talk about compensation systems for salespeople who feel the same way that you do, which is, you know, you can't just, you know, at least in telesales and probably generally speaking, you know, better than a, just a flat percentage of gross margin dollars reward growth because that's what you're trying to get. Debbie, when you think about the total comp of a proactive inside salesperson versus a field sales, of course, it varies by geography, but what what might be a percentage that is paid for the proactive versus the inside? Is it is it 50%? Is it 90%? Where, where's that likely going to fall? The proactive versus the inside? Oh, versus a customer service rep? No, no versus the field sales rep. Proactive versus the field sales. Oh. Yeah, it could be. It could be. I mean, it really varies based on what that company's plan might be. But yeah, it could be up to a 50% difference. Because you're talking about typically the base salary is going to be lower for a proactive inside salesperson. And hence, probably the, the commission program as well. Um, just because a larger part of it's going to be base, and then you'll have the variable piece. So I think overall, the compensation for a proactive inside salesperson is going to be lower than a field salesperson, 25 to 40%, maybe, hmm. depending on that, the market. That much. Wow. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and as we're going to cover in a little while, a lot more, a lot more uh, account coverage as well. Um, so we have a question. What have you seen as the best tools for selecting the right accounts for inside sales? This person says, I've used AI and profitability tools and old-fashioned local leaders. Are there others? So how do you choose the accounts uh, for inside sales? Yeah, I think it gets back to really defining what your goals for the program are first. So typically in distribution, we find that um, distributors typically are focusing on the top, you know, 10 to 20% of, of accounts. And those are typically assigned to a field salesperson. The, the sort of second tier we call them smaller to mid-sized customers, typically aren't getting that kind of support. And so they're not, they're not growing. Um, and oftentimes they're defecting. So one of the things we like to do is we like to do some analytics, which we call a customer profile, and really define where those opportunity accounts are. We have a way of identifying opportunity. Um, if we have time, John, I can talk about a little bit about that later. But so we t- tend to want to focus on the accounts that aren't currently getting any coverage at, at the time. And we typically do that through identifying using, you know, um, prior sales, prior profit um, opportunity, which we define using our analytics. Um, and those are typically the programs that we look at first. Now, the challenge there is that some of those accounts could already be assigned to a field salesperson. So, you know, it's the old 80 20 rule that we talk about all the time, you know. So, a field salesperson is going to be working, you know, of their accounts, which is going to generate 80% of their revenue. And then there's usually a whole layer underneath there that doesn't really get a whole lot of attention. And so what we advocate is we say, let's take that that bottom layer and your medium size accounts and start with that as the base of accounts for the inside sales team. Right. So they may actually already be assigned outside reps, but they're not getting any sales coverage. So we we have another question. We have a couple of questions that are stacking up here. Where do you place the prospecting function, telemarketing or proactive inside sales? It depends on what, again, which you're trying to do. It can actually fall in either place. Um, So telemarketing is typically defined as sort of a one-off situation, whether it's a one-off product call, it could be a one-off prospecting call, or it could be part of a prospecting program. 
It could be a, a one-off call as part of a new customer onboarding campaign. Right. It could be a one-off reactivation call. So um, either proactive instant sales or outbound telemarketing is where prospecting could fall. Um, any customer lifecycle program could start there. The difference between the two is really that proactive instant sales is also accountable for a base of accounts. Outbound telemarketing typically is not. Got it. So they're, they're measuring what based on campaign or something. So here's a question though, Jonathan, I don't know, you may have more experience this than the rest of us, but um, I mean, as you know, most distributors, well, I don't know about most, many distributors are not actively measuring their customer life cycle, right? They're not measuring onboarded, number of onboarded customers, number of traded or defected customers and looking at, you know, migration between deciles and all that stuff that you do if you're a sophisticated uh, marketing and sales company. Um, so I'm assuming that when you put in place something like inside sales telemarketing, part of what comes with it naturally, because you have to measure these people somehow, is you start paying attention to uh, customer defection, retention, and onboarding, or, you know, and what's the total customer count, right? Absolutely. I, and I think to your point, Ian, if you look at that top decile, the top 10% of your customers as defined by either revenue or margin of some type, those customers tend to be very, very stable in terms of retention. Um, note to self, if, if they're not, you've got, a, you've got a big problem. But for most distributors, those accounts are very stable. When you go to that second 10%, the, the, the second decile, they're churning at a rate three to four times Mm -hmm. that of that top decile. So one of the things, and I actually it might be worth going to the next slide, Ian, one of the, <laughs> the, the benefits of the proactive inside sales program um, is if you look at that bottom one, um, it improves the, the, the customer retention through more focused service and sales. Part of what's happening is these customers um, are, might also or are likely also somebody else's mid-size or small account. So right. they're not getting attention from field sales. So as soon as they start getting um, systematic service and systematically worked, um, their loyalty, you, loyalty to you goes way up. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, 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 I was in one of the roles I was in because, you know, I've done – you know, VP of marketing at several different distribution companies. And one of the roles I was in, I ran a customer count over five years and it was like going down, 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 down. I called it the going out of business line mm -hmm. and no one had seen that before. And, you know, and so that helped to justify a lot of marketing expenditure to increase the number of contacts to get people, you know, to quit leaving us. But it's funny how just those basic measurements, I mean, I'll ask, you know, distribution executives, you know, what's your customer churn? And they frequently don't know. I mean, mm -hmm. ask them about their working capital performance and they're all over it, right? Ask them about their mm -hmm. sales rep productivity. They know that stuff. But ask them about customer count, which is just a basic number. And, I, you know, probably a lot of people on this call are more sophisticated than that. But generally speaking, that, that's something that people aren't paying attention to. Mm -hmm. Now, we have, a, we have a couple more questions. Um, one is, do you find that inside sales becomes an admin function of field sales if there is not a defined book of business for each? Yeah, it, it could be, and that's why you have to have, again, I go back to really defining the goals for the program. What is it you're trying to accomplish? If that's something you're trying to accomplish, and, and it's a perfectly valid thing in some businesses, then, then that's what you would create. But the way we're defining and advocating proactive inside sales is it's a separate team. It doesn't, it, it might interact with field sales. There might be an opportunity that they might uncover in an account, inside sales might uncover in an account, and then they might need to have feet on the street. Um, doesn't happen a lot because you usually try to make that differentiation between what accounts field sales is working versus the accounts proactive inside sales is working. So I um, rarely see that it becomes an admin function because you've defined what it is up front, and that's how you that's how you work, you work and run the program. The yeah, but you're, that's because you're involved in these engagements where you're bringing process and structure right. and defining the roles and you're probably screening for different types of personality or strengths right. and weaknesses for different roles. Mm -hmm. My guess is if you just experiment with it, and I've seen this happen before where, you know, you have, you create this outbound calling function and outbound account management over the phone. And, you know, to your point, the, the difference is supposed to be, they just aren't using a car, right? It's going in person. 
but over time they wind up getting sucked into the work in the branch, you know? Yeah, so the, that's the big, yeah. the big one. Is that what you see too? Yeah, absolutely. That happens. That can really happen often, especially if the group isn't sort of insulated in a way, right. you know, where it has, it has a real strong form of management around it. And everyone has bought into the fact that this is a separate team. They won't get drawn into that. But I've seen that happen time and time again, you know, where, oh gosh, you know, we've got 10 people out today um, right. and we, we need to cover the phones. So right. off comes the inside salesperson. And so they sort of get derailed by that. Yeah. They and it's they, done with the best of intentions. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But, you know, it's like, would you call your all your outside sales reps and have them come in to answer phones if you were right. short staffed? Probably not, but it's with well, that phone person, they're sitting right there. We can just suck them into the workflow. Exactly. Now we have another question. It says, surely there is duplication of roles with inside sales and external sales, although they are classified as inbound and outbound, question mark. Question mark. As inside sales, and what was the other one? Outbound sales? Uh, yeah, is there, surely there is a duplication of roles with inside sales and external sales. Here's where the rub comes, I think, uh, related to this question, Mike. Um, and it's also related to the previous question, which is at some point the, the company has to make a decision that these accounts that were formally assigned field sales but were not being worked, some of them or all of them perhaps are now going to be assigned to inside sales so they will be worked. And that's, that's where you see the duplication and, and, and frankly, uh, potentially the conflict unless inside sales is given legitimacy if, if inside sales is subordinate to field sales, field sales is going to say, great, this is my account, even if I'm not working it. Um, and then if we go back to the prior question, where inside sales is almost becoming an admin function, you see that kind of a dynamic. And that's really a key point, Jonathan, is, and we'll see this in, in one of the slides coming up, but is really to, there has to be a commitment to this program by everyone in the organization. Um, top down. Because what happens is when you start to create the account bases, it can get a little bit tricky, you know, where, where someone might say, you know, hey, you can't take this account away from my field salesperson. You know, they, they called on them last year or whatever. Um, and so oftentimes it can be a little bit tricky in terms of really defining what those bases are because you do want that differentiation. You want to be able to measure the effectiveness of both programs, your field sales program and your inside sales program. So, you know, commitment is really key and, and making sure you pick the right accounts is key to this program being successful. So there's a question that's related to all this, which is, would you recommend proactive inside sales be remote based so as not to be sucked into activity versus growing sales? Mm. So typically what I prefer is to have it be centralized because right. there's, there's a real group dynamic. You know, in any sort of um, sales organization, the salespeople kind of feed off of each other. And in, in inside sales, we tend to be much, we, we measure a lot of different things. And we also tend to incent and have, you know, contests and fun incentives and that type of thing. And so it's, it's, it's good to have all of the salespeople together. It's harder to do that when you've got, you know, someone sitting in, you know, the Memphis branch and someone else sitting in the Denver branch. And then that also makes it easier for them to get sucked into the branch activities. So I always advocate for trying to, to centralize the group, if at all possible. Yeah, um, so the answer is difficult, but it would be my preference. Sorry about that, Debbie. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, so you're saying not just be remote, but, you know, rather than have people work at home, have them in a central location. And I, I tell you, there are several advantages to that, because in addition to making it less likely that they be sucked into the work and, you know, being able to support each other and what can be, you know, emotionally demanding job, you also leverage management and training and technology. Exactly. Um, and, you know, you get this, this sense of mission around this team, this, this sense of team that you don't get if, you know, you're the only person in your branch who's doing this particular job and nobody really can relate to it. Yeah. Um, so here's a good question. When do you feel an account should be moved from inside to outside sales and how would you manage it? Mm -hmm. That's always the question. And, and that's actually part of, of what we blend into the program is how do we do that? And some companies don't want to do that at all. 
their feeling is that if the relationship has been created and built with that inside salesperson. So there's really no reason why you would need to migrate it to field sales unless, you know, there's a significant amount of extra opportunity and business you could get from that account by having feet in the company and by having feet on the street. And I'll tell you that doesn't happen that often because again, if you selected the accounts properly, you know, you're, you're not going to have, probably not going to have a billion dollar account um, come out of an inside sales account. If you've done the work properly up front, yeah. but there are going to be times, you know, when, when maybe you want to have a field salesperson stop by. And then those are the situations that have to be defined and, and explain to everyone. So everyone's on the same page essentially, but, yeah. but we rarely advocate moving accounts back and forth. Let the field salespeople focus on their, their accounts and the inside sales people build relationships with their accounts. Yeah. So I think not often. Yeah. I mean, I think one of, one of the voices that often, often gets left out of that discussion is the customers. And Absolutely. there are customers, especially, you know, millennials, Gen Z, et cetera, and they really don't want to have somebody call on them in person. I remember, you know, having been in senior marketing roles, you have people who call on you to sell you marketing services. And I mean, if someone showed up unannounced and they wanted to talk to me about advertising or something, I mean, that just seemed unprofessional and annoying. And I think it's a little different when you're in a purchasing role, you expect that a little bit more, but it's still not great. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there were a few people that I wanted to meet with in person because they were large strategic marketing partnerships. But for the most part, I just didn't have a phone call with people Mm -hmm. and I didn't want to start getting called on in person. Um, and I would imagine, you know, from what I've heard, customers are the same way. Sometimes they'd rather just have a phone-based relationship. Um, but I'm also intrigued by what you said about, um, I mean, are there, are there times when you have an outside sales rep and an outbound telesales person calling on the same account or outbound, outbound account manager, excuse me? Mm-hmm. Yeah, there, there would be those opportunities. Again, they're not, it's not a common thing. Mm-hmm. But yeah, you might, you might, if, especially if the customer says, Hey, why don't you come stop by and see me, you know, and, and I'm in Memphis right. and you're in, you know, Denver, that's probably not likely going to happen, but I could right. have the Denver field salesperson stop in to see you. So it's going to be typically, it's either driven by opportunity. If the inside salesperson feels like, wow, if we could just get feet inside that, that customer's facility, I think we could get a, a ton more business that would be one option. And then the other option would be if the customer actively asks and says, Hey, I'd like to see somebody. Yeah. I I think you, I mean, I I think you do have to sometimes convert inside accounts to outside accounts and and vice versa. I think it goes both ways, but I I think, you know, just like salespeople have an account review with sales management, the outbound tellers or the outbound sales reps who are working over the phone need to do the same thing. And there are times when account is just, it's a big complex account. They might want to do vending or, you know, some type of complex um, system connection um, and uh, like an e-procurement platform. It just becomes time for that account to either have the addition of an outside sales rep added or have the account move from inside to outside. So to me, that should be a deliberate management decision that's based on customer reviews that happen with outside reps and happen with inside reps mm-hmm. and you do it on a structured basis. So unless a customer asks for an immediate change for some reason, you know, once a quarter you go through your review and as a business, you make a, you make a, a, a decision about what's best for the customer and what's best for the company. Here's another place where that plays out Ian. Uh, so there was a question earlier, um, Debbie mentioned that sometimes we look at the potential that's in an account. So you look at the potential that's in an account and it's showing that this is an account that clearly can grow to field sales. But right now it's performing at the level of a house account, right? And maybe it's doing like $5,000 a year, but this thing's got a big upside. So you could very intentionally say, great, let's have the proactive inside sales groom that account with the understanding that when it gets to a certain level, it's likely to be handed off. Um, and that way you can, you can do the so-called acorn to oak example, right? Um, where inside sales is helping growing that acorn into an oak with, with the understanding that's going to be handed mm-hmm. off. And that can happen with mm-hmm. existing accounts. But again, if we, you know, if you do a good job of selecting the, the base of accounts, you're going to be okay. But from a prospecting perspective, 
yeah, that could very well happen. Um, even if you're doing onboarding, a new customer onboarding campaign, yeah, there could definitely be, you know, acorns that can grow into oaks out of those programs as well. So there is, um, to Ian's point, there there is a defined program that I, I've created um, to make that determination. When should it move from inside sales to field sales? And, you know, part of that is there's got to be a plan. If, if you're going to move the account over, then you need to hold that field sales person accountable for that incremental growth. It's not just something that's going to go on their base and then they don't work it and they just hope that it's going to grow. So there's a very defined process of how and when to do that. So we have a couple of questions uh, in the chat box. One is, what sort of group communication tools, Messenger, Slack, Basecamp, have you incorporated to centralize remote teams? So can you create sort of this virtual centralized team using technology tools like Messenger, Slack, and Basecamp? Yeah, you, you absolutely can. Absolutely. And obviously Zoom, right, to have right. You know, meetings and, and, and that type of thing. So there, it definitely is much easier today to, to create more of a virtual team than it, than it ever has been. Right. Um, so yeah, absolutely. But, it, you know, it comes down to, you know, really finding ways and focusing on ways to build that team spirit in a virtual way. It's a, it's a little bit harder, obviously, than when everyone's together, but there are yeah. still ways that you can do that. Um, because if you're remote, you know, again, going to the branch concept. So oftentimes customers will say, well, you know, I've got this great person out in the Denver branch and, you know, I think they do really well in this program. So they're one person in the Denver branch. Everybody else is doing something different. Right. And here I sit kind of out there, right? I need to feel like I'm part of a team. And so it takes, I think it takes extra work in order to build a virtual team, but there certainly are all those tools mentioned um, are excellent ways to do that. Okay. And so the, he had a follow-up question, which is have these tools been efficient in creating a team environment for branch or remote based members? And it sounds like you're saying yes, yeah, if you use them well. If you do, if you use them correctly and you're really focused and consistent about it, it's got to right. be consistent. Got it. Okay. And another question, what do you feel is a manageable account size list? And I would ask you to answer that for, uh, for the inside account managers who are making outbound, you know, who are working accounts over the phone. Um, and maybe if you have an opinion on it, outside account managers, and then I'll, I'll share mine. Okay, great. So I typically want to go with between 150 and 300. And the reason why I've got such a large span is it depends on what they're going to be doing. If they're only working a base account of accounts and that's, they're not doing any prospecting or any of the other life cycle campaigns, um, then they can handle more accounts. So that, so maybe you're looking at the 250 to 300 range, but if they're actively you know, prospecting, they're actively onboarding new customers, they're doing retention calls, they're reactivating old customers, then, you know, as, as those activities grow and increase, then you're, they're going to have less time, obviously, to work their account base. So it, depend, it depends, again, on what programs they're going to be doing and what the goals for the program are. Yeah. And uh, any, either of you have an opinion on, so, so you're saying for the, for the outbound account managers, um, they can manage 150 to 300 accounts. And it, what about outside sales reps? Um, you know, that, that, that really varies a lot. I mean, I've seen, you know, a field sales rep have five accounts because they're huge. Sure. And then I've seen other field reps have 100 accounts because they've got mm -hmm. more of the smaller to medium size accounts. So it's really going to vary by company and how um, and the size of the customer on the field sales side. Jonathan, you have an opinion on that? I think the fairway on that, where, where it likely ends up, is in the 25 to 50 range. Yeah, I was going to say, manage. yeah, I was going to say 50 is about the max. I mean, I mean, you know, if you actually do the math on how many sales calls outside mm -hmm. sales reps make, and this will make somebody on this call angry probably, but it's, they, you know, the, the analysis says they do make about three a day. Now, you know, look on- That's good. Yeah, I mean, if they can make eight, that's great. But the reality is they've got training and they've got vacation time and they've got order expediting and they wind up doing deliveries and they wind up, you know, spending half a day with the customer who's got a big project coming up and has a lot of needs. And so, you know, if you really take all that out of the equation, it's about three a day. So you don't really have, you know, then you have, you know, 212 days a year or whatever of uh, that you work. And then, you know, so that's not a lot of sales calls to split among an account base. And so, 
you know, typically if you, in my experience in most uh, uh, verticals of, of industrial distribution, sales reps manage about 30 accounts actively. Mm -hmm. And then they have another 20 that they really don't hardly touch. Um, and uh, if you go more than that, all you're doing is adding to the number of customers who mm -hmm. get no love at all. And, and, you know, I just think you have to be realistic about it. And I think, you know, this gets to the takeout box at the bottom of the slide, you know, proactive inside sales can reach 20 to 25 customers per day. And that is actually a contact. That's not just leaving a voicemail, right? That is a conversation. Correct. You know, getting back to what you were saying, Ian, about the field sales, what I see often happens is that the site base of accounts is tied to, to their compensation. And so field sales people typically want more accounts because they're paid on a percent of their gross margin dollars or a right. percent of top line sales. And so, um, I mean, I've actually worked with field sales managers who say, I got to get this guy more accounts because right. I want him in this compensation range. Yep. So it's, it's, you know, it's, it's kind of a backwards way to look at it, but, but I, I see that happen quite frequently. I've seen that a lot too. It's like, I need to get so-and-so, you know, 20 more accounts and try to get another million dollars of sales in his, in his uh, package so that he gets more money. Right. Um, now here's another question. How would you track? Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Jonathan. And, actually, before that, I mean, there's actually a benefit that's unstated on the slide, which is you're freeing up field sales time to focus on the accounts and they're not bothered by these mid-sized accounts. Yeah. Right. Right. You're, you're applying your most expensive resource to your high, highest potential accounts. Right. It, but it's really a double win because they are calling on these smaller customers anyway. And That's so right. you're taking these customers that might have a lot of growth opportunity. And for the first time, in many cases, they're actually getting sales contact. Right. And they may have been assigned to an outside rep, but the, if the outside rep never talks to them, then, you know, they're not really selling. All right. So here's That's another. Why, go and ahead. That's actually why, Ian, why we're seeing 15 to 20% growth in that top box is because right. these accounts are virtually untouched. Right. And so now suddenly, oh, wow, you know, you're calling me? This is great. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Okay, so here's another question. How would you track inside sales to see if they're being effective uh, outside of a sales goal? Would it be call tracking or using a CRM system? So that would be one of it, one of the parts. And, and it's, it, the measurements are going to change based on where you are in the program. So at startup, let's say on, you know, day one to day 60, um, you know, you're just, you're just starting to reach out to, to these new customers, you know, maybe, maybe you have to reintroduce yourself, you know, maybe they don't even remember who you are, um, depending when they, when they last purchased from you. So when you're just beginning, sometimes it's better to have what I call an activity measurement. So you really want people to start to get in the mode of picking that phone up and making the contacts. And so typically I might say, start off with some sort of an activity measurement of, you know, calls per day, which you could measure with your phone system or contacts made per day, which you can measure with your CRM system um, as a way to kind of get started and get the team into, you know, their kind of modus operandi. And then as they work the accounts and they start to create relationships over time, then I like to switch to um, what I call a goal measurement. So that's when you start to look at, you know, how, what's the retention level on my accounts? How many new accounts am I converting to a regular customer, meaning purchase three or more times? Um, how have my gross margin dollars grown year over year? How have my top line sales grown year over year? So, so to me, it's kind of a, you start out with your activity measurements right. while you're building the program, creating relationships, and then you, you kind of switch over to more goal measurements. Got it. Got it. So you're ensuring activity up front because there's, it takes a while for that activity to turn into sales. Correct. And then, it, and then when it's the appropriate amount of time to start expecting to see sales. And now how, how, how long is that? Is that six months or? You know, it can vary. It depends on how large the account bases are and how quickly people get through them. But typically you can start to see results in three to four months. In fact, I had a, um, a customer that I had trained earlier in the year um, contact me uh, and tell me that they were at 20% sales growth after four months. Wow. So it, it depends on how quickly they can get through the, the account bases and how quickly they can make their contacts and, 
and build their relationship. Got it. So as we look at these benefits, you know, so you're going to grow revenue, you're going to increase gross profit through higher margin accounts, you're going to reduce sales comp, you're going to improve customer retention. But I want to, there seems to be a little bit more to the second one than, it seems like that's an oversimplification, Jonathan. Is there more behind that? When you say oversimplification, what, what, what do you mean? It says uh, increase gross profit through higher margin accounts. It's a very simple idea. If, if you okay. look at the, the accounts that we typically target or that, it, mm -hmm. that are typically a good focus for this, if it's that second or third decile, right? In industrial, for example, the second decile is going to be six or eight or 10, maybe 12 points higher gross margin than your top 10% of your accounts. Yeah, that's my experience. And then in construction, it's going to be less. It might be, it might be four to seven or eight percent at the high end. Um, but definitely that second, that second decile and third decile account should be much higher margin than the accounts that field sales are typically assigned to. Got it. So you're just growing your proportion of sales coming from higher margin accounts. Mm -hmm. Bingo. Okay. Um, all right, good. Let's go on to the next slide. This is our last slide. And so for those of you who are listening to the podcast version of this, we are uh, making sure that we are speaking to the word so you don't have to have the slide in front of you. So this slide is called keys to outbound success. And there's six points on here that are the keys to outbound success. I'll read them off real quick. One is you got to have senior management support. Secondly, you have to have the right people with the right skill sets. Third, you have to have the right accounts, not too big, not too small. Fourth, you need good incentives and recognition programs. And fifth, you need devoted resources to the program. And six, you need tracking activity and results in CRM. So you need measurement. So let's take these one by one. Keys to outbound success, senior management support. Uh, I've got some strong feelings about this. You guys want to jump in first though? Sure. So what I find is if, if you don't have this support, the program typically is not going to last long because if senior management doesn't understand and support the fact that you're creating this new capability within the organization and that this is how it's going to operate and that you might be touching accounts that might have, you know, be on a field sales base um, and buy into that and support it fully, the program is not going to be successful. Then what happens in getting to the right accounts, what happens is you end up with the, the bottom of the list of house accounts that, you know, that don't have the opportunity to, to grow and then the program just doesn't work. So there has to be really strong senior management support for the program to, to work well. Yeah, that's, I tell you, Jonathan, you want to comment on that or you want me to jump in? Well, it's, it's related, as Debbie said, to that third um, bullet, the, the right accounts. You, you, not too big, not too small. Sounds a little bit like Goldilocks, and that's exactly what it is. Um, you can't get a meaningful ROI if you say, here, take these dinky um, house accounts and try to make something of them. Uh, if they're too big, you're going to be running into conflict with field sales all the time. So it's got to be right in that sweet spot of, of where they should be and supported by senior management. Yeah, my experience is, you know, I mean, uh, you know, for years, people talked about how e-commerce couldn't succeed without sales support because sales could kill the effectiveness of the e-commerce program. I think the same is true with this program and maybe even more so. It's, mm -hmm. It feels like a direct threat. And you not only need uh, senior management support, you need a bunch of change management to make sure that the salespeople uh, see this as good for them because you've designed it so that it is good for them, that they're going to you know, get better accounts and more time with them. And it's not going to, you know, the compensation for this group is funded out of the sales growth for the accounts that they're assigned, not out of the compensation that's going to outside account managers. Now, over time, you may have a rebalancing of the load where you have fewer outside account managers and more inside, you know, uh, outbound callers. But, you know, that should happen through attrition and over time and not these, this, because if this is seen as, you know, an aggressive way to go after salespeople, they'll, usually be successful at killing it. Mm -hmm. uh, second one, the, the right people with the right skill sets. Debbie, what's your, are, do people have the tools to understand who the right people are and what the right skill sets are and then slot them into the right roles? Yeah, you know what I, what I often see is um, when we start to talk about the right people, the management team will come back and say, well, there's this great CSR that yeah. would just, I think would just be great in this role. And then I say, why do you think they'd be great? Well, they love to solve problems. You know, yeah, they, right. they love to make their customers happy. 
you know, and I'm so, and that, that's when I say that's not the skill set we're looking for. You know, that's a customer service skill set. And, and to tell you the truth, that, you know, they're on the opposite side of, of a good, what a good salesperson would be that I would hire for an inside sales program. So um, it's the, the CSR's mindset and skill set is not the skill set you want in this role. You want a sales skill set. You want someone who's going to pick that phone up day after day after day after day, create relationships, look for opportunities. Um, and that's not typically a Salesforce mindset. It's so, not so fair. It's for service mindset. Go ahead, Jonathan. When you think about um, knowledge of product and application versus sales skill, if you had to come down on one side or the other in who you put into this slot, um, how do you choose between those? Well, obviously the optimum would be, you know, for someone who has the industrial distribution background and the sales skills, right? But that doesn't always happen. And so for me, I prefer to have to, to hire the salesperson and train them on the product side. I know that a lot of, of companies think it's best to hire the product knowledge and then try to develop the sales skills. And I've never had success with that. If you hire the sales skill, it's, it's oftentimes easier to learn the product. Now, I, I say easier, you know, with, with distribution, there's so many, you know, products that a distributor has is, and it's very, can be very technical. Um, and it, it's gonna happen over time, but I still would rather err on the side of having the salesperson and bring them up to speed on product versus the other way around. Yeah, so I you, tell you, you, you go for the you go for the athlete. It's kind absolutely. Of what I, look, I mean, we when I I was in a company where we had an outside account manager come in from another industry. In second year in, he was the fourth best selling mm -hmm. account manager, and and I actually spent a day making calls with him because he was so remarkable. I mean, he hardly knew anything <laughs> about the product, mm -hmm. but he knew where to get answers, and he just created this expectation from his customers that they were going to buy from him. It was really powerful stuff. And I think the same is true. I think, you know, look, it's about fit and it's about skills. I mean, you know, Michael Jordan is arguably the best basketball player in history and he's got a 201 lifetime batting average in the minor leagues, right? I mean, it's, it's, it doesn't take away from his basketball playing skill, but he's not a pro baseball player. And the same is true with these people moving into these very different roles. Okay, uh, I want to move on a little bit. The right counts, accounts, not too big, not too small. I think we've discussed this a little bit. Do anybody want to add anything to this? And, and, and I assume you're talking about potential, not actual, right? Actually, a combination. We're looking at a combination of actual and potential. So, Go on. Um, yeah, so you might have accounts, as we said before, that are performing at, an, at a house account level, but they have inside account potential, right? right? Or you might have accounts that are performing at an inside account potential, inside account level, and, and they're right in that sweet spot of where you think inside sales should be. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we look at we look at both dimensions um, in in selecting accounts and 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 how we want to approach them. Like I mentioned before, you might be approaching it with the with the intention to groom it and hand it off to field sales, or you might say, "Hey, great, this is going to be a great uh, inside sales account." Got it. Okay, good, good. Um, and then good incentives and recognition programs. Mm -hmm. And again, this gets back to what you were talking about earlier. In you know, incent for what you want. You know, and so that that means defining what you want this program to be. What are the goals of this program? And then based on those goals, create incentive programs around it. Because the last thing you want to do is incent for behaviors you don't want. Because you'll get them. Because you absolutely will get them. So, yeah. so it's, this is a this is an area to spend some time on and really give this good consideration. Yeah, I wrote a column one time called um, "Salespeople Don't Have Company Hats." And that came from more than one sales meeting where I've seen a VP of sales delivering bad news to the sales force. And he or she is saying something like, look, I know you're not getting commission on this new program, but we need to put on our company hats to do the right thing for the company. And that is always the start of a failed initiative. Mm -hmm. Salespeople do not have company hats. And if they did have company hats, they wouldn't be good salespeople. So okay. you've got to ask them to do, you've got to reward them for what you want them to right. do for you because they, you will get exactly what you reward. You will not get something different no matter how frustrated you get about it or how about how much you demand it. Right. Okay. Devoted resources to the program. So this is really getting back to what we were talking about before in terms of if you're going to have an inside sales program, 
then the person who's doing inside sales, that has to be what they do. I've had situations where companies say, well, you know, I've got this person, you know, she needs to work part, you know, part time in as a CSR in the mornings and in the afternoon, she can make her, her outbound calls. Well, guess what doesn't get done, mm -hmm. right? So, so, you know, she's just going to be focused on doing her CSR work because she might get, she gets sucked into doing other stuff and that type of thing. And so the programs, the, the calls never get made. So my recommendation is if you're going to do this, identify resources and that this is what they will, that they will be doing, nothing else. And, and isn't this a management challenge as well? Because I have seen more than once distributors take someone who really didn't know anything about, you know, managing an outbound calling group you know, over the phone account management and the learning curve on everything from the technology to the best practices to selecting talent to reward systems. It's just such a steep, you know, curve that the person can't get over it in time or can't get up it in time to make the program successful before it fails, you know, or, or, or to make it successful before the company runs out of patience, I should say. And yeah. And that's absolutely right, Ian. And that's why the program that we create, when we create, the, and I call it creating the capability within an organization, hits on all those cylinders from we help you hire, we help you create the job description. You know, from, from, from point A all the way to the time that the reps are trained to be on the phone, measurement, training, product training, sales training, and everything in between. Because if you think you're just going to go find you know, some, a CSR, you think, oh yeah, they've got sales skills. I'm going to just give them a basic accounts and let them have at it. I guarantee you the program's not going to work. In fact, we're talking to a client today who's tried this three different times and none of those times have, have been successful because they don't know how to put a program together. Right. I mean, you know, experience matters, right? You wouldn't hire a, a financial accountant who didn't understand financial accounting, but for some reason, we feel okay about putting unqualified and experienced people in a sales and marketing yeah. role sometimes. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, tracking activity and results in a CRM. Is a CRM necessary right from the start? Can you, you know, do something more manual up, up front? Because uh, it feels like that could be a pretty significant change management and, and investment up front. Is it, do you have to do, start off with that? I don't recommend trying to do it in any other way. Okay. Um, and oftentimes what we'll do is if there's not a CRM within the organization, we will bring CRM in and use it for inside sales. Okay. Because it's usually a, a smaller, more focused group. So it's much more controllable. You, you know, we create the processes around how it's used specifically. Um, and what we found is this is a great way to bring and introduce CRM into a company who doesn't have it today. And so they see, you know, the other salespeople see how it works, the manager, managers see how it works, and it kind of takes away the mystery and the shroud around, well, do we really need CRM? I right. believe that you do in order to do this role properly. All right. So, but you wouldn't wrap it into a widespread CRM for the first time across the whole Salesforce initiative? Not if there's no CRM in the company today, no. Right. That's, that's, that's hard. That's hard to do. That's why I, I say, you know, create your inside sales team. Let's implement CRM there in a very controlled way with processes. And, and that's how you get your feet wet. And then from there, you can start to roll it out to field sales or CSRs or, or whatever. Okay. All right, Jonathan, you want to add anything to this? Um, no, I, th I think I've covered it pretty well. Okay, good. Then I'm going to wrap up. Um, so this is our contact information, and this deck will be available on distributionstrategy.com, uh, which is the website for the business. If you have questions about this or anything else related to distribution, uh, there's a use form on there. You can reach us at these email addresses as well, or just give us a call. We've all been in distribution for a long time. We're very happy to help you. Uh, we'll answer any questions we can, give you referrals if necessary, and try to help you grow your business. So thanks very much to our panelists. Debbie, Paul, thanks so much. It was great having you on as a guest. Jonathan, as always, great hosting with you. We argued less this time. I think we were more in alignment. So that was kind of fun, but maybe the next time we'll, we'll get after it on something. I, I've got the gloves out in the back room. I'm getting them uh, oiled <laughs> up right. for the next, next encounter. Great. All right. I hope everyone has a great balance of the week. Uh, thank you so much for participating. We really appreciate it. And uh, please, uh, we look forward to hearing from you in the future. Bye now.